the beauty of America is we solve problems individually. We don't have a government that says you do this. It's our brain that makes this happen. So if you think at 95, I'm going to give advice to a whole bunch of guys that are smarter than I am. No. The <laughs> trick isn't to be smarter. The trick is to be a better thinker. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Welcome, everyone, to another Walker webcast. Uh, this is my last live webcast of 2022. Uh, and before I dive into an intro to my two guests and uh, uh, our discussion on both the economy and the Great Age reboot and its implications on the commercial real estate industry and our economy, uh, just a couple quick notes. The first is that um, over 6 million people have now watched the Walker webcast, and it is a true honor that I've been able to get the guests such as Al and Peter to join me um, every week uh, over the last two and a half years since the beginning of the pandemic to talk about everything from commercial real estate to the broader uh, markets to athletics to leadership to um, civil rights, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the second thing is that I don't do this alone. Um, every week, Susan leads us in, but Susan leads a team um, that puts together everything from the social media um, push outs before we do it to all the follow up, all the posting to YouTube, as well as our podcast that gets put out there every week. And so to that team and to Susan, thank you all for all of your great work. Um, I had three, three of my colleagues on the Walker webcast two weeks ago for a view of where we are in the economic cycle and what's happening with interest rates and what's happening with cap rates, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that webcast with Ivy and um, Aaron Appel and Chris Mickelson has now been watched by almost 150,000 people uh, on replay on YouTube, uh, and that's not counting the podcast views. Um, and that displaced the number one previous webcast, which was a discussion that I'd had with Peter, which had had uh, 110,000 views on it. And so, Peter, I have to say, I'm, I'm sorry that you and I have been knocked off the top spot, but I'm still on the top spot and you've been knocked off by my colleagues, Aaron and Chris and Ivy. So uh, sorry about that. Um, but um, it is just a it's a real joy to have Peter join me once again. I was able to see him live for a BizNow conference in Philadelphia about three weeks ago, and it was super fun for the two of us to get together in person and have a, a live discussion in front of a really great audience at the, at the BizNow Philadelphia conference. Um, and Al, it's always great to see you. And uh, let, me, let me dive in with, with, with this as a starter. Al, you were born in 1927. Uh, you are now tipping the scales at 95 years old. Um, this conversation is on longevity. This conversation is on the changing demographics of the world we live in. Why did you sign on to writing this book, The Great Age Reboot with Mike Roizen and Peter Linneman? And out of all the research and all the findings, what's the most compelling to you as it relates to either the health implications or the economic implications of The Great Age Reboot? So um, I got to know Michael Roizen about 10 years ago. We started playing ping pong together. And uh, he's now 72, 73. I'm 94, I'll be 95 in a week. And I consistently beat him, which is important. But he was doing a bunch of broadcasts on what was happening with research. And I said to Michael, it seems like so much is going on that there seems to be some great change taking place in the country. And he then turned to me and said, and you're describing what's going on in the inner city. And what you're telling me is nothing we're doing is right, but there's a right way to do things. Is there some of the connection between longevity and some of the social problems we're doing? So we decided we'd write a book. We started writing a book by Michael who knows every research in the country. We got partway through it when I turned to him and said, this is going to change every demographic we have. Let's call Peter and ask Peter to join us. 
So Peter joined us and we're the three that did the book. The first thing is it all hinges on the science. If the science doesn't happen, which we believe it will, these changes don't take place. The takeaways that we have basically say that within the next decade, the decade we're living in, the longevity will increase by 30 years. It normally increases two and a half weeks, uh, two and a half years every decade. This decade will be 30. And it comes about by 14 different scientific things that we pointed out, but there are a lot more than the 14. And the takeaways are, it is the greatest disruptor we've ever seen because it extends the number of years that you can do what you do. The chip is our last great disruptor 70 years ago. And we needed this disruptor. So the first thing is it's a great disruptor. Because of what happened with the genome, we now determine how long we live. It was thought our genes determine it, we now know that we can affect 80% of deaths by the things that we do, that we're our own engineer and it's all in our hands. That's the, the side of the effect. The financial effect was when we were about to publish the book, we took a look at the projections of the Congressional Budget Office. And what we discovered, if you go through them, what they say is, we're going into a free fall. And it's a lack of births in the country. It's births minus deaths plus immigration. So the births have gone to hell. The projection of the budget office is that our GDP over the next 30 years is going to be one and a half percent. And that our country is going to close down. We don't believe that. But what we do believe is if we understand the opportunity and longevity, we can have an economic and a life that we never dreamed of. So, Peter, going to those numbers that Al just points out. So the Census Bureau right now believes that the U.S. population in 2050 will be 390 million people up from the 333 million today. If you take Al's numbers, you all are projecting that the U.S. population will be 451 million by 2050, a significant 61 million additional U.S. residents over the Census Bureau projections. What's that mean from an economic standpoint? By the way, just before we get there, it took three of you, three others, Willie, to surpass my one. Oh, yeah. You see, I knew you were going to go back to the numbers. I love it. That's great. I want to like per- Al talking. I, I just I want to be very clear, everyone here, that the two you and Al are not competitive people because you immediately harvard back to being now in second place. And Al wanted to make sure that we all knew that he still beats Mike in ping pong. So I just set the record clear. We're good there. Three beat right. one. I got it. Go ahead, Peter. Got it. There you got it. So it, it has dramatic implications. The, uh, Albert said it when I first Albert and I've known one another since I think. 1989 or 90. And, and um, when he called me, I think in 2018, about this, it was, and everybody tells us we can't afford it. And when they described it to me, which is not only people live longer, it's not like they're going to live the last day of their life an extra 20 years, right? It's not like you're sitting on your deathbed an additional 20 years. It's you're sitting two more in your 20s, two more in your 30s, two more in your 40s, two more in your 50s, et cetera. That's how you get the extra years. And and yeah, you'll still be on your deathbed at some age, right? The, well, once, once you grasp that, that it's not just longer, it's longer and much more uh, vital, much healthier. You, of course we can afford it. All we have is human capital. And so what they mean is tremendous amount more resources. So we, we go through in the book some numbers that are pretty obvious, but I'll give you a couple of examples. If people live, let's say, 20 years longer 
healthy, healthy and vibrant and active. Well, first of all, some of them are going to want to work because it's kind of interesting. Some of them will have to work because they're going to live a lot more years. Well, if they work even just uh, at, at five more years, you know, think of the typical person, they work about 40 years. Well, if you start working five or 10 more years, it's an enormous increase in your lifetime productivity, 10 to 20% increase in everybody's lifetime productivity. And it's better than it sounds because when were the least productive years of your life, uh, socially and economically, unless you're an athlete, it's when you were young. Those were your least productive adult years. Peter, one of the things that David Sinclair at Harvard has estimated that every additional year of life expectancy added in the United States adds $38 trillion to GDP. Um, but there are a couple things that are somewhat worrisome. The, 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 the first that I would point out is that most people still do retire at 65 or 67. And right now we have social security kicking in at 67 years old. And projections are that the social security trust fund is already going in to more withdrawals than additions this year. And that if we keep going at this rate, the social security trust fund will be defunded by 2035. Um, and so back to the kind of, can we afford it question? If we can't figure out social security, I believe that the average couple in America relies on social security for 50% of their income. And the average single senior relies on social security for 70% of their income. So I understand your point about someone like Al continuing to work well past 65 years old, but what about the average American who's relying upon social security? So one of the things is that people adjust to the reality of life. And um, as I think, uh, Look, my cohort, my baby boom cohort, I see some people re retiring at 63. And I say, why? And they go, well, it just seems like I should. Well, that's a terrible reason. That's a really terrible reason to retire. It seems like I should. That's almost like everybody else. Remember when you were a kid, everybody else is jumping off the cliff. I guess I should too. So I think you're on to something, Willie, in the saying, this is why Albert's phrase, it's a great disruptor. It's got to disrupt individuals and society. Namely, it's not what everybody is doing. It's not that it seems like I should. And there's, I, Albert, I think you would agree. There's some people who are retiring at 63 today um, who in three years or five years or seven years, are gonna regret it. They're gonna regret it socially. They're gonna regret it economically. Um, they're gonna re regret it in a lot of ways. And you're right, Willie, put it this way. If longevity increases very fast, faster than trend, it's unlikely that the society will, re uh, will evolve quite as quickly, right? Social norms. And there will be a bit of a dislocation. The good news is if we can get healthier, we reduce our medical outlays and that gets us some cushion to make these transitions. So for example, if we were able to reduce lifestyle illnesses, not deaths, just illnesses, diabetes, blood pressure, et cetera, um, if we could reduce those by half, by genetic engineering, medical advances and self-engineering. That's 7% of GDP we would free up. So yes, I suspect you're right. Society evolves more slowly than medicine, but we will have cushion to cover the gap. Al, you lost your grandparents and your uncle quite young, the year that you were mitzvahed um, and from having heard you talk about it, you didn't think you were gonna live a long life. Now that you are 94, about to turn to 95. I also, I also recall hearing that you didn't eat that well as a kid. Um, and yet here you are at 94 to 95 years old. What is it do you think that's given you the opportunity to live such a long and vibrant life? Well, the, the first 
thing that happened to me uh, was my my grandparents came here in 1920 with my father and my grandmother loved me and she gave me more chicken fat, more schmaltz, more corned beef than any human being could take. And she gave it to me because she loved me and I loved it, but it didn't love me. So here I am, 95, I have 18 stents and I'm still here. So the first thing is, you can't convince me I'm 95 because I don't feel 95. I don't know what it's like to be 95. But what happened was when I read, met Michael and started talking to him, before we did the book, we talked about a bunch of things like eat during daylight. So I eat during daylight. Don't take such portions. So I started to take better care of myself. But this is what I believe. What keeps me alive is my passion and my posse. The medicine will catch up with that. But my whole life, I've been blessed with wonderful, wonderful friends. And I've always had a purpose. My purpose is to see that we repair the world. And if you have a purpose and you have a bunch of friends to join with you, then somebody else will keep track of how long you live. I've never measured how long I live. You live every day like it's your last day. But the biggest thing is why are we living and what's our purpose? And it's part of what's wrong with the country. We lost our way a little bit. This is a way to get us back. I'd make one other comment. The population now is in 50 is now down to 367 million people. It keeps decreasing every year. The reason I goes up is our death rate because of science goes down from nine three to two three. Per and thousand. Per thousand. Per thousand. And that differential among the 87 million additional people that will have over what they say have has a booming economy. So Al, talk for a moment about this. You're a real estate guy. You've been an incredibly successful real estate investor. Um, you still live in the homes you lived in when you were 70 years old. You still live essentially the same life that you lived when you were 70 years old. So where's the opportunity? I get that this year, for instance, P&G will sell more adult diapers than it will sell kid diapers. But I don't think many people on this webcast are going to go into the diaper manufacturing business. They're trying to figure out from a real estate standpoint, how do you play to these demographic trends? There have been a lot of people who tried to get ahead of the seniors housing um, needs. And in some instances, it's materialized. In other instances, it hasn't. And we can dive in deeper on that. But as you as a real estate person sit there and say, okay, what has happened for my additional 25 years of living well beyond what actuarially you should have lived to? Where's the opportunity to get dollars from Al Ratman? Well, I have to start out by saying that the difference between what I'm capable of doing at 95 with what I was capable of doing at 70 is enormous. I know more people, I have more contacts. So I'm so much better at what I'm doing than when I was 70 years old. That's the first thing. The second thing is if you look at the statistics, this is what it says, going ahead, from 2000 to 2050, it's 50 years. We've gone, to, we'll have gone through 22 of those 50 years already. Where do we end up in 2050 and work backwards? So this is what we learned. What we believe is in that 50 year period of time, or now it's a 30 year period of time, there will be an increase of only 5% in people 40 years old and younger. Think of what that means to schools and to colleges. There will be an increase in people that are 80, 79 years to 40 
of 25%, and an increase of 550% of people 80 and older. The difference is they're not what we think are 80 year olds today. They're 80 year olds and 90 year olds functioning. So here's what we say. We look at the long run. Housing is gonna be fine because you have more people living, but it's gonna be different. Housing can end up like B and B. I live in 8,000 square feet half the time. Somebody can live in the other half the time. So we, what I believe is that you have to start at where we're going to be and work yourself backwards. Here's what we believe. There will be trillions of dollars made through longevity. We're trying to figure out what it'll be and how it'll be. So each of you have to do the same thing. If this is what you believe, play it backwards. The final thing I'll tell you, I was giving a speech with a bunch of real estate brokers. And I said, I was supposed to die when I was 55 years old. I keep getting phone calls for people who want to sell my unit. And I tell them they have a long time to wait because uh -huh. I'm not going anywhere. Now, just think of that. Everybody, we believe almost all of the people that are living in 50 are living today. They're already here. They're not gonna be born. We're only gonna have 33 million more people born. So the people are here. Well, if everybody on this phone lives longer and lives in their home, where do you get the movement? Where do you get the transaction from people churning because there are new people coming in? So it's to be figured out and th this is a challenge for all of us. Peter, uh, to, to Al's point, um, in 2007, um, in multifamily housing in the United States, um, in the 34 and under demographic, they accounted for 38% of rental housing in the United States. To Al's point, it's projected that uh, by the time we get to 2035, which isn't that far away, that cohort falls from 38% down uh, to 27%. The middle from 38 to 60 stays relatively static at about 44% of renters and rental housing. And the big increase is in the 60 plus, which goes from 18% of rental housing occupancy in 2007 to 31% by 2035. So what do owner operators need to do as it relates to the shifting demographics in rental housing in America? So with the regard to rental housing, they're gonna to have to understand that um, they may wanna have more items they've kept in their life, right? They're gonna want visiting space for relatives, right? So that maybe you have um, uh, available space that you can um, rent out or, or use out for guests, children, grandchildren that are visiting. Um, they're going to have to figure out what services. They're less likely to want to be um, playing beach volleyball, let's say, at the apartment complex, as, as the demographics you're describing. More likely to want to have social gatherings whether it's bridge or whatever it is. And I think Albert's right, you have to figure it out. I'll take another industry, Willie, and I know some of your people are in that business. Albert's been in that business, retail. Retail, is, retail shopping is about satisfying the needs of customers. We are on the early phase of the largest, healthiest, wealthiest group of people in history. And they're not who the industry has typically focused on, right? The industry in the 50s and 60s focused on, um, you know, Ozzie, uh, excuse me, Harriet and Donna Reed, right? The, the mother who was home while the father worked. They then went to the two worker house. They went then to satisfy the needs of the young. You're now on the edge of, the disposable income in society is going to end up in the hands of people 
55 and over. And that's going to be a whole different pattern that has to be figured out. So it's really to uh, take one more sector, Willie, related, is that uh, senior housing. You know, the, the math was always, gee, around 78 or so people start moving into senior housing. Well, that's already drifting up to 80. And by the way, that could easily drift to 90 or 95 over the next 20 years. That has dramatic implications on that sector. But then they're living somewhere, to Albert's point. They're living in single family homes. They're living in condos. They're living in rental. So traditional rental, traditional single family looks good. And senior, not nearly as good as people who have been saying the baby boom is aging. If the baby boom is chronologically aging, but not sociologically or medically aging, it's going to be a longer time. So Al, there's an one point I would make is yeah. if I were betting on what I would do, I would bet that in the future, it's going to be much less living space and much more common area. So people, instead of living in 8,000 square feet, will live in 2,000 square feet. And they'll have dining rooms and they'll have gyms and they'll have a place for their kids to come to. We have such a waste in all the space that we're living with and the way it gets used. That's going to become much more economic and it's going to be much better because we'll have the services of our doctor. We'll have everything we need in which places which we live. So I want to push for a moment on the assumption that people live longer and healthier lives um, because the science clearly, and Al, you talked about this at the top, is there's a bet that we know the genome, that we're um, having advancements that are truly eye-popping and eye-spinning and allowing us to extend life. And yet at the same time, 10% of the U.S. population was obese in 1960, and today 43% of the U.S. population is obese. 43%. And so if we continue to get if, if, if that, and by the way, that is one of the key, key drivers of heart disease, of diabetes, of, 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 of chronic illnesses. Um, if we continue to not take care of ourselves, does the science really matter? So yeah, it, matters. it matters for this reason. They now have tested in two animals, being able to turn white fat into brown fat. Brown fat we're born with keeps us warm. White fat is what gives us all of our obesity. What we believe among the 14 things is within this decade, there will be a pill that would obliterate totally obesity because the genome has allowed us to understand what happens to the body. So we believe obesity is going to be gone. And it affects now 50% of our people. Yeah, very much so. I mean, it's a huge issue. It's one of the big issues that Mike, Mike focused on. Go ahead, Peter. Let me, I would, and I would say exactly what Albert's saying with a slightly different way, which is things that we cannot easily do for ourselves because we don't have the discipline. We don't have the... Uh, uh, resources, whatever it might be, obesity being a good example, but not only. Uh, think of addictions, think of, of uh, other kind of abusive behavior. If we can modify, you know, you can't, let me put it different. We have in our capacity changing our own DNA to do it. But most of us, as you point out, Willie, find it very difficult. Well, one of the things medicine historically is good at is doing what you don't easily do for yourself. We immobilize your foot because, yeah, you could, I guess you could just hold your foot like that without a cast, without a walking boot. Just, just hold it like that for the next four weeks. Well, what medicine is very good at is figuring out well, yeah, I guess you could, but it'd be very difficult. Let's make it easier. And if you think about a lot of this genetic 
research. It's how do we make it easier for people to do what they find hard to do from a health point of view. And the resources that could be saved by doing so are just staggering uh, when, when you think about it. Um, and imagine addiction. You know, I know one of the, we don't write about it, but one of the things they're trying to figure out is the genetics of addiction. And we know that that relates to a lot of death and a lot of crime and a lot of suicide and a lot of, okay, fine. Suppose they find that if, and it's not like people are trying, there are a lot of people trying to stop being addicts. Now let's suppose that we change three DNA cells and addiction disappears to substances. What an amazing, it's not that people aren't trying to do it on their own. And many people are trying and succeeding. This is, just think of it like, we're gonna help you do what you find hard to do. That's what it's, and by the way, as a business matter, if you can find a way to make something valuable, easy to do for people that they otherwise find hard, you're gonna get rich. You're gonna get rich. Al, I was, I was looking, listening to David Singer at, at Harvard on a, on, a, on a speech he gave, and one of the statements he said that caught my attention was he said, Frailty is more dangerous than actual age. And it, he went on to say that every 19 seconds in the United States, an elderly person falls and, and breaks a bone, which in many instances is a, is a death sentence at that time. What should we be thinking about as it relates to usability in the fixed environment? Peter talked about the changing retail needs of, of elderly Americans and clearly what is stocked on the shelves has to change. But what about from a usability standpoint, given that issue as it relates to frailty versus actual age? Well, the answer is young people basically don't aren't frail. So what it says in effect, if you're 90 and you're frail now, and 90 is like 40, you won't be frail because there are all kinds of things that you can do to prevent that from happening. And it's, it's the, the key to this is all the things that I did were very strict things. So I went to Pritik and it was very strict. The difference of what we're talking about is we're saying to people, do what you love and loves you back. If you don't like to take steps, play ping pong. If you don't like to play ping pong, play with your grandkids. But pick a lifestyle that suits you. We are giving sunshine, not castor oil, and you're making the decision of what happens. Nobody is saying to you, you have to do this. We have an application, and in the application, you have all of these choices. What, what are you going to eat? What are you going to eat? So we think we can't get out of our mind the world that we're living in because it's been there. More people over 50 drink beer than under 50. You've never seen a commercial of somebody 50 years old drinking beer. Mm -hmm. 65 as a retirement agent. That number came from a German general who in 1850 asked his people at what age could my soldiers live to, and I want to give them a pension a year later so I have to give them one. <laughs> We're still living what we did when we had kids in the field. So this is a, it's a mental transformation. This is what we believe. You don't have to do it. I'll give you, ten, I'll ten give you another things will happen. You just won't be here. A couple of small examples in our business are going to have to evolve. Um, how many times have you been uh, with a shopping center owner and they say, oh, we restriped our parking lot to get more cars in? Right. And you go, well, you just may as well put up a big sign out front saying uh, Lineman Plaza. No, nobody over 65 is wanted here. 
right? Because they restriped them to be narrower. They're harder to get into, harder to get out of the car once. You, I mean, just, just tell them up front, you don't want them there. It's a lot easier, you know? You go to some garden of shallow, right? In terms of the depth of somebody to step on, as opposed to extending the step an extra inch, et cetera, et cetera, in the design. There's a lot of small things that are going to have to be done as well as some big ones. The big money is in figuring out the big stuff, but then you're gonna to have to execute on the small stuff as well as a real estate person. But I would ask every apartment owner to bring, um, most. there are not a lot of the people listening as apartment owners who are 75 and 80 years old. I'm sure there's a few. Um, go get your friend, your grandparent, your neighbor, whatever, who's 80 years old and take them to your, through your apartment complex and make them walk up this, make them do whatever, right? And listen to what their reactions are. Um, bring in a 60 year old, right? And have them react, bring in a 50 year old, have them react. And, and, and don't just keep Albert's point about the Germans is, is right on. Don't just keep doing the same thing actually bring in test customers, if you will, and have them react to the space. So Albert, one thing that you said previously that I think is very interesting is your comment about smaller unit sizes and more common space. And that makes sense, but we are still to some degree living in a hangover from COVID and um, the sense of being separate from each other and not being together. And obviously there's been this sort of reunification that's happened on the other side of COVID. But I was wondering, as I was traveling this week, I went through TSA and um, I'm sitting there looking at TSA and I'm kind of scratching my head saying 20 years later, we still have the most inefficient check systems you can possibly imagine. The darn bins were being hand pushed through and they were still doing the wanding and they're still doing the same thing. And I sat there and said, 9-11 changed materially the way that we travel. And I don't know if it'll ever go back to pre 9-11. I'm curious, do you think COVID and all the health issues around COVID has the similar type hangover effect on the way that people live and socialize going forward? Or do you think we revert back to what life was like in 2019? So Michael, who's our expert in this, went back to look at what happened when the Spanish flu came, which was much worse. In the case of Spanish flu, uh, the third year after it started, the population what, and growth rate was longer than it was before. When people get wiped out, the way they figure longevity is they figure every year will have what happened the last year. But in the case of Spanish flu, things were better when it was over. This is what I believe. What I believe is nobody knows what happens with pandemics. People are now studying them. What I believe is this. One, we're not going to go back to where we were. It's going to be better. Two, if we go back to where we were, running our government where kids don't get educated, where hospitals don't function right, we have no future. Because you have to look at our national debt. Peter and I argue about whether it means anything. You have to look at what we're doing now. The beauty of longevity, it changes everything because we can start all over again. And I'll give you an example. We talk about income inequality. The single biggest reason for income inequality is the lack of longevity of people in color. And it's simple, if they live eight years long or less, than other people do and they make $30,000 a year, what happens is they're gonna have income inequality. Well, as you get better medicine, as you get telemedicine, things like that happen. Another big issue, it costs so much money to raise a kid. So it costs $300,000 to raise a kid today between the years of one and 17. If you have three kids, it's $900,000. If you make $30,000 a year for 40 years, 
that's 30 of those 40 years. So you look at that and you say, we're going to change our policy about kids. We're going to take care of daycare. The opportunity for longevity is to start over. That's what we need to do. We can't go back to where we were because it doesn't work. And by the way, this is worldwide. There's some people that have more population, but they don't have increases. They don't have the resources. So don't look at going back. We have to do better. And that's, that's that goes to the point you and I were talking about earlier, Willie, which is to the extent that medicine outstrips social adjustment, for lack of a better phrase, um, we're going to have some stumbling around, right? People are still thinking I'm going to retire at 65 because I'm going to be dead when I'm 75. And it turns out they're going to be alive when they're 100. And they don't fully realize they're going to be alive when they're 100. But if they did know they were going to be alive at 100, they'd have worked till 75. Those kind of adjustments are going to take place. And some are going to do it better than average, and some are going to do it worse. Probably government policy is going to be the laggard simply because it's a big ship to turn around. Any government policy is a big ship to turn around. Albert and I have both, and Mike as well, have, have been proponents of something like Singapore or Holland or a couple of other, Australia, I believe, have policies of, uh, of essentially forced savings. Because one of the things, if you believe what we do, probably even if you don't, you want people to be sure they've been saving regularly from day one when they started working. Even when they weren't making much, 5% of it was put away in a safe, uh, well-diversified way. That's going to be an adjustment. And some individuals do it without the government helping. Probably the government helping and incentivizing is a good thing there. But there's a lot of things that if, if we're used to growing linearly, the social pattern is going to have to catch up to health growing faster than linearly. So in the, in the pre-call questions, there were a number on immigration policy and immigration policy has to play in with demographics. Uh, and so I just want to talk for a moment about immigration, both legal as well as illegal and the impact that, that has on overall growth in the economy. Um, because I, first of all, as I did some research on the numbers, I was actually quite surprised by the numbers. Um, on the illegal immigration numbers that I pulled out from both the CDC, Homeland Security, and tried to back into exactly what the actual numbers were, and it's lagging data. So in some instances, yep. Center for Immigration Studies is making a projection of what happened in 21. But generally speaking, what I could take out was that we have about 11 to 11 and a half million illegal immigrants in the United States, that that number fell down precipitously during two things both in tandem, the Trump administration and the pandemic, very difficult to sort of differentiate at that time because you had kind of a, if you will, a double whammy of both a very hard line from the Trump administration as well as the pandemic, which brought immigration numbers down precipitously. But it went down to about 10.2 million illegal immigrants in the United States. And now it has gone right back up to about 11.4, 11.5 illegal immigrants. But not a big change between where we are with Biden and where we were during the Obama administration as it relates to that number of illegal immigrants in the United States. On the legal immigration side of things, what I was surprised at is that the number of green cards issued by the United States government peaked at about 1.8 million in the late 1990s during the Clinton administration and has right. come down quite a bit over the last 20 years to the point where right now we're giving out somewhere around 800,000 to a million green cards a year, which is legal immigration. Um, what's your take, Peter, on either um, really fighting illegal immigration because that is the, that's the if you will, the black market of the economy, we're not getting tax dollars for it. Those people are costing us for social services and things of that nature and increasing legal, or given that there are 48 million immigrants in the United States, including both legal and illegal immigrants, is that 
just kind of part of the numbers and that's not materially going to change the GDP okay. outlook? So um, most people don't know what you just said about the legal part. It's why people like me have been saying for almost uh, 25, 30 years, we need a revamp on the legal immigration because it's been in a downward spiral, even though world population has increased, even though the number of people desiring to be here and work legally is way up, it has been going down. We need a reform to get more people here legally. Um, that's pretty clear. And by the way, I think, Albert, you're uh, second generation born in this country. I'm second generation born in, in this country. Lots of your listeners are, are either first or second or third or fourth generation born in this country. Um, I remind people also on the legal, let's stay with the legal one more part. Everybody says, well, we need to let the PhDs in. I have a PhD. I'm not so sure I want all the PhDs in, but that's a, that's a, that's a, you know, don't go into the kitchen, you know, and, and see how things are cooked. No, but seriously, everybody says, oh, we want the nuclear physicists. We want the engineers. Of course we want them. But I don't know about your parents. I, I don't think your parents were PhDs, Albert. And, what, and, your, and my grandparents, um, my grandparents couldn't speak. Uh, they were largely illiterate. And, but my their 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 ends their, their subsequent generations have done a lot for this country as they well should and so i encourage people to not get hung up on yep maybe a point system is a good thing maybe it would get more in maybe it would be politically viable to use a point system but i would bet a lot of the people on this call have ancestors who were close to illiterate when they came to this country and weren't highly educated, and, and, we, and we wanted them as well. On the illegal front, the hard thing on the illegal front is it's hard to say I'm for illegal immigration, right? It, I'm, I, it's hard to say you're for anything illegal. What I think that has to be done there is we have to, these are people who want to be here. They want to be here. They want to contribute to our society. Most of them would be very happy to work. I gave a talk once where somebody said, you know, the problem with these immigrants is they want to take our jobs and collect welfare. And my comment was, you can't have both. You can choose one or the other. And the truth is they want jobs and they're not taking jobs from US citizens. By and large, they're, they're adding to the workforce, they're adding to demand. So the, obviously, we, I don't think any of us want criminals let in, real criminals, hardcore criminals. So what we need is a route to get more people in legally who should be here, who 30, 40, 50 years from now will be on your show when you're doing interviews for yeah. Walker and Cass still. So, Al, yeah, the you comment I would just yeah, Al, go ahead. Make is, if you look at the cities that have the greatest economic growth, they are the cities that have 15 or 20% of their population as foreign born people. That's been the whole history of the country. And you go to places that have 5% immigrants, they have no growth. So the first thing is we need immigration. The second thing is you cannot have illegal immigration because it means you have no border. Whatever that means, you can't have it. But if you say, I'm not going to have illegal immigration, and you don't have legal immigration, you have no future as a country. Remember this, the new immigrants will not be white people. They will be people of color, because that's the whole increase in population. So this is going to be a very different country in 20 years than it is today as far as the racial makeup is concerned, and, and which is why we have to get people educated. And it's the challenge for society, and it's not an easy challenge, is the same one we've always had. How do we have a vital enough country uh, with a uh, viable enough political environment and a vibrant enough economy to absorb all that, even as we change as we're doing it, even yeah. as we changes we're doing it and 
if you're afraid of change, you shouldn't be living in the United States. I don't mean that as a throw them out. I mean, this, of all countries in the world, this is the country about change historically. It, it, it really is. So one of the things that I found very interesting when I was doing research on immigration numbers and the number of first generation immigrants to the United States is at 46 million. I sat there and said, how can it only be 46 million? And I then went in and read, uh, which I'd forgotten. And Al, you'll definitely remember this. In 1986, under President Ronald Reagan, we signed the Reform Immigration Act, which did two things, which this Congress and Congress's controlled by Democrats and Republicans have not been able to come to an agreement on this. But the 86 Immigration Reform Act did two things. It one cracked down on businesses for hiring illegal workers. And so it made it so we had to check documentation, which was, if you will, to say, we want to make sure that everyone who gets a job is paying taxes and is an actual citizen. And at the same time, we gave amnesty for everyone who had been a long-term illegal immigrant in the United States up until 1980. And so in 1986, all the people who had been here for, I think it was 10 years prior to 1980, were given amnesty and became U.S. citizens. Therefore, if you will, capping everybody and making them, if you will, U.S. citizens and not immigrants to the United States, which is what caps it at 46 million, 46 million Americans. And I just find it to be so interesting that this big major issue that both sides understand we must do something about cannot come to some type of agreement to really put the dollars and, and the enforcement behind doing exactly what you said, Al, which is stop the illegal, and at the same time, as Peter said, increase the legal. By the way, Willie, it's worse than you said, because in those years since the Reagan uh, reform, we have had where the Democrats had sufficient power in Congress and the White House to do it by themselves. And we've had periods when the Republicans alone could have done it by themselves. They didn't even have to come to a compromise with each other and we couldn't do it. I mean, what a disgrace, what a disgrace. Yeah, 65% wow. of the Americans agree with exactly what Peter just said. Yeah. I mean, people want it. You, I, I tell you, one of the other things that, you, you, as you saw, I get a little exercise when people say, well, don't let the uneducated in because they would have never let my, my, my predecessors in, right? But I also get a little excise, exercise when people say, um, well, you know, some of them are criminals. Well, I don't know if anybody's read the history, but some of the Jewish immigrants were Meyer Lansky and Bugsy Siegel. And some of the Italian immigrants were, were you know, mafia guys and some of the German immigrants and some of the, by the way, it would have been better if we could have kept, quote, them, but that was a great bargain. If you've got to let the occasional Meyer Lansky in or the occasional Al Capone in, to get what we got from those populations. And you can do this for every population, right? It's, it, it, you have, you'd make that bargain. So I wanna close on, on specifics as it relates to, to if you will, the, cohort, the, the seniors housing space for just one moment, which is just that what I hear both of you saying is that there will be need for housing, but potentially not the type of seniors housing that we all thought people were gonna need, that if you can actually impact the genome and you can do genetic re-engineering, that people will not only live longer, but live more active lives. So am I hearing there, if you will, don't go long on you know, critical care, seniors housing, go long into active adult, go long into um, sort of um, new forms of senior housing that are doing what Al said as far as smaller units and more common space than what we traditionally have had of older people wanting their own units to stay in them and be a little bit less on the social side. Where would the two of you invest in the senior housing sort of um, orbit, if you will, right now, given what you are thinking about medicine and given about demographics? And the one other thing I'd say before I shut up and let the two of you answer that question is this. We all know that typically seniors live closest to their oldest daughter. So while everyone says, let's go long Florida seniors housing and lots of people who are older like to live in a nice climate, many times they are located near where their daughter has a job. Does that rule break 
as the daughters actually are retirees themselves taking care of mom and dad. And so that actually in those, you now have double retirees living in warmer climates rather than older adults living in Buffalo, New York, where the daughter has a job. I'd say on the last one, yes, you're going to get a big change that way. In the shorter term, it's, I, I've been trying to figure out the senior space. And I think your active adult is the easiest or the most transparent play um, because if, if 90 is the new 45, they'll still want that active adult because a lot of people, it's funny, people want their own kids around but not other people's kids. That's active adult. Active <laughs> adult, I want my kids to be able to visit me but I don't want anybody else's kids around. That's what it is. The one that's harder, Willie, that I haven't really been able to quite figure out is for the next seven, 10 years, there are going to be 50, 12 years, there are going to be early phase boomers who have not taken care of themselves. The medicine hasn't gotten to that point. They are not self-engineering and there's a spurt in demand coming from the boom. However, behind that, is the, let's say the latter half of the boom, who medicine is gonna help a lot not to need to be there and the subsequent generation. So you could have this situation where there's a spurt for five to seven years of early boom where they haven't self-engineered and genetics hasn't engineered and then a dip off as they become younger uh, uh, in the relevant sense of life. So I think that's a tricky space. So Al, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the last question to you, which is this. Your uncle Charlie was one of the first developers to go to South Beach and build a hotel called the Clevelander Hotel. And right. the Clevelander Hotel has been not only a, um, a, a staple of the South Beach uh, hotel market, but he was early. He caught a trend early. So as you look at everything here and you had to put a dollar somewhere in the senior housing world, where's your Clevelander hotel going? In other words, where and what type of asset? So I was listening to this conversation and thinking everybody on the phone heard something else. The beauty about America is we never all did the same thing. And there were always a group of people who everybody thought were nuts that went somewhere else. So if I were looking at this, I would look at where everybody is going and say, that's not where I want to be. You go there, but I want to take a piece of this and go here. And whether that go here means you build a city, there's a city in Florida like that, that's fantastic. The beauty of America is we solve problems individually. We don't have a government that says you do this. It's our brain that makes this happen. So if you think at 95, I'm gonna give advice to a whole bunch of guys that are smarter than I am, no. The <laughs> trick isn't to be smarter. The trick is to be a better thinker. By the well, way, what I just say what I said before we went on, I said I saw a, a question from Jim Klingbill beforehand saying that he has no question. He just wants to listen to Albert, who's a living legend. And if Jim, you're listening, I agree. He's a living legend. And, and I would agree. And I would I would say that about both of you. And so uh, I, I get to close this out by um, both wishing both of you extremely happy holidays. Happy fourth day of Hanukkah. Um, and um, to everyone who's listened in, have a wonderful holiday season. To Susan and the team again, thank you for all your great work on this this year. And to everyone, um, have a fantastic holiday season. And to Al and to Peter, thank you both very much. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.